Thank you to the City Club sponsors who keep us going. Special thanks to our Platinum and Gold sponsors, ASI Wealth Management, the City of Bend, Central Oregon Community College, the Desert Pine Group at Morgan Stanley, OSU Cascades, St. Charles, the Central Oregon Association of Realtors, and Brooks Resources. There's a longer list available at our website, cityclubco.org. City Club is excited to feature one of our values each month. This month, we are featuring the value of inclusivity. We strive to welcome community members from all walks of life and provide programming that represents diverse viewpoints. We hope with your support, especially through membership, sponsorships, and donations, that we can further reach into the community and bring more people to the table. We are honored to have Emily Curriton Cook from OPB leading us in conversation today. Emily is OPB's Central Oregon Bureau Chief. Her reporting seeks to hold powerful people to account, promote honesty and transparency in public affairs, and amplify voices of rural, Central or- of rural Oregon. She has formally contributed to award winning programming um, to the Georgia Public Broadcasting and Jefferson Public Radio, and reporting to community newspapers like Del Norte, Triplicate in Crescent City, California, and Big Bend Sentinel in uh, Marfa, Texas. Please welcome Emily to the stage. Um, but before we get to hear from the experts, I just want to get a sense of who's in this room and what your relationship is to these institutions. So if you work at OSU, Cascades, or COCC, if you are an alum at either of these institutions, or if anyone in your family is, can you please raise your hand? Wow. So that is um, just really cool to see. I love being reminded that even though we are talking about institutions today, we are really talking about people. We're talking about our neighbors, our families, and our life. Um, And with that, I want to introduce um, our experts and our leaders here today. One is actually a geologist and a researcher by training. He holds a bachelor's degree in geology from Rice University and a doctorate in Earth Sciences from Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego. He went on to hold faculty positions at Boston University and Duke University. For the last 30 years or so, give or take, he's been serving Oregon State University. He spent more than a decade as Dean of the College of Science and another 11 years leading the university's budget and resource planning office. Last year, he took over the very top job at OSU Cascades. Um, Let's all please give a warm welcome to Chancellor and Dean, Dr. Sherm Bloomer. Our other speaker today became president of Central Oregon Community College in 2019 and led the college through a global pandemic. She herself is a first-generation college graduate from a rural working-class family. She has a doctorate in English from Notre Dame. She taught English for 14 years at a variety of colleges, and her administrative experience spans 18 years. Um, She's worked at both two-year and four-year colleges, and before joining COCC, she was the president for academic and student affairs at Grand Rapids Community College in Michigan. Please give a warm welcome to COCC President Lori Chesney. It is hard to believe it's been 18 years since an administrator. Well, I am very grateful and want to express my city club for sponsoring this forum and giving Sherman and I both share a little bit about our colleges and uh, give us a chance to answer your questions. So well, uh, I have a short uh, span of time today. So first off, I want to say... If you want to look at our information a little more thoroughly, um, you have a booklet on your table uh, that contains a lot of good factual information about the college. I want to share with you and, and make sure that you all know what our new mission statement is that arose out of last year's strategic planning process. And that is Central Oregon Community College empowers students and engages communities through high quality, equitable, and accessible lifelong education. And I I hope you see that theme throughout my remarks today and throughout the answers to questions. Everyone always wants to know, um, everyone always wants to know how's enrollment. And that's really important. We all know that. It affects it affects our budget. An important point of data is are we providing access people that we serve, that we're charged to serve? Um, because I think that's what's really the most important. 
As you probably know, enrollments at community colleges run counter to the especially employment. When employment is high, our enrollment tends to go down. So you can see from this chart that we reached a peak enrollment during the Great Recession. Since then, until very recently, we've been gradually losing enrollment. Last year, we served nearly 12,000 students, a little over actually, 12,000 students. And this slide gives you a sense of that scope of diversity that takes a diverse array of courses and programs. We have transfer programs that can lead a student very seamlessly to great places like OSU Cascades. We offer two year and even shorter term a career in technical education in a variety of fields. We offer pre-college work like developmental education in areas like math and writing, adult basic skills, and um, education for English language learners who seek to move on to college. We also do, as I said, workforce training and community education. And next slide, please. We're comprehensive, we're diverse, and we really prioritize access and affordability. Open access institution, which means that anyone seeking to improve their situation, seeking some form of education, is well, there are no specific admission standards or grade point averages. So it's, it's often second chance for folk. Other, other scholars of higher education have referred to the colleges as democracy. Says we have four campuses, Bend, Redmond, Madras, and Prineville. We offer a wide variety of modalities of instruction, including online, and I'm proud to say, our COCC Foundation, the oldest community college foundation in the world, is going to be offering a record $2 million in scholarships in the coming year. So next slide, please. So we take our commitment to our students very seriously. And we also take our commitment to the community very seriously. Maybe a lot of people don't know is, is how much higher education institutions actually contribute to the economic health of a community. And so about a year or two, Oregon Community Colleges undertook a study of what the economic impact is. You've seen in the uh, scrolling slides that the higher the education you get, the higher the credential, the higher the earnings. Um, so I'm not going to focus on that, but I do want to focus on the first statistic, and that is when you look at operations, student spending, and alumni impact, COCC's total annual impact is $289 million on our region. To, to share more about our commitment to community. We are involved, I know, as, as OSU Cascades is, in working really hard to partner to solve the challenges that our region. One example of that is in early childhood education. Um, I'm particularly proud of a program that was developed in partnership with Neighbor Impact with others. Uh, it was developed by our small business center. Uh, in partnership again, and that's the Early Child Care Business Accelerator Program. It trains folks to either open an in-home child care center or a commercial child care center. And we aspire to be an even stronger leading partner in workforce development. We will be with a consortium of other community colleges in 2025-6 offering a BSN uh, that our, our folks have been asking for. and. We're creating new curriculum that supports the, the needs that we have in our region for mental and behavioral health services. Some of our great faculty have uh, created a community health worker certificate. Um, we are so excited <laughs> about this project. We are expanding our Madras campus. It is a 24,000 square foot facility. Our opening date, I believe, is winter 2026. Um, this building will house our nursing, nursing assistant, medical assistant, and early childhood education degrees and certificates. And it will also host an independent 
child care provider of Children's Learning Center in Madras and open up up to 100 new child care slots for the citizens of Jefferson County. And that's great, and it also provides the lab for our early childhood education students to train to be the workforce we need for the future. I'm so excited I can't stand it. Um, and and I, I'm going to say, I don't think any project we are currently doing, I love them all, don't get me wrong, um, I don't think any project more perfectly embodies our mission. And so we're super excited. And I hope I got it in seven minutes. Close? I'm a little worried, maybe not. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you to City Club so much for the invitation to talk about higher education. You can tell both Lori and I never get tired of talking about the mission of our institutions. Um, we're at the other end of the spectrum. CSCC is the oldest community college in the state. We are the newest uh, four-year university campus in the state. And uh, some of you know the history much better than I do, but just for those of you that don't, we started in 2001 and we started on the COCC campus with one building as a two plus two program. We offered junior and senior classes. 2012, we got authority to become a four-year um, university offering four-year baccalaureate degrees. In 2016, we opened the first building in the campus over on Chandler and Century. Where we are right now, is there's about 1,313 students on campus. About 1,100 of those are undergraduate students. About 250 are graduate students. There's 24 baccalaureate degrees. There's three master's degrees. And there's one uh, doctorate degree, doctor of physical therapy degree. I'll say a word about that in a minute. And uh, demographics, not, not different than what Lori pointed out. Many of our students are Pell eligible. They are coming with significant financial need. It's one of the most important things we're, we're thinking about and spending time on is how do we make that affordable? Uh, many of our students are first generation students. Many of our students are serving Central Oregon. They are students coming from Central Oregon. And this is one of the arguments and then the truths about having a four year university in Central Oregon. Nationally, you look at data and students typically don't go more than two hours from where they live to pursue a baccalaureate. And so there is a huge barrier. It's like 70% of students don't go farther than two, two and a half hours. There's a huge barrier if you go farther than that. It makes a big difference having a campus available in Central Oregon. COCC is still one of the primary pathways for students to come to us, and a large number of our students still come as transfer students. Changed a bit during the pandemic, but we're starting to see that uh, come back. One of the important things to know about OSU Cascades is, is how, we, how, we are, how we operate. We are funded 60% by tuition and 40% by state dollars. Um, if you look at o OSU writ large, OSU is actually only 22% funded by the state. Four-year universities, public four-year universities are majority funded in the United States right now by tuition dollars. And that's one of the challenges that we're facing. It's one of the reasons we think so much about financial aid. Uh, OSU, and, and we mirror this, we're offering at OSU Cascades about $3.6 million of institutional financial aid. From before the pandemic till this year, OSU doubled the amount of financial aid. They are giving from institutional dollars to $95 million to try to address this issue. One of the things, next slide, one of the important things about OSU Cascades is we are part of Oregon State University. We are part of one of the nation's leading land-grant research universities. And so what comes with that is really three things. Land-grant universities do three things. We offer education. Um, and we get to offer that. We bring, we have all the connections, all of faculty are parts of OSU Corvallis. We're part of that big organization. We have access to those resources and that experience and that national reach, but we're also small. We get to teach classes with an average size of 20. We get to have very personal relationships, faculty and students, and we get to do things that respond to needs in the community. And so our degrees, we have stood up degrees. We have, we have high demand degrees, business psychology, but we also have things that are very specific to needs in the region. So we stood up a biochemistry and molecular biology degree to start training students who go into the biotech industry. We have an outdoor products degree, relative with obvious reasons for that. Uh, because, but the industry in, in the region was very involved in shaking that degree and thinking about what it could be. And we have a doctor in physical therapy degree. It's, 
because there was no public university in Oregon offering a physical therapy degree, and there's oddly demand for physical therapists in the region. We also get to do things outside the classroom differently. Is we, we've stood up a program in the last year called Cascades Edge. It's trying to embed career experiences in every class, every term for students as they come through. So they're thinking about where they're going to go when they finish. And we also get to do something. The picture is of James Nichols, who with his partner Ryan Holmes donated their snowboard company to us this year. And so the students are going to run that company. They're going to do the design, the marketing, the whole nine yards. Pretty, pretty unique. Next slide. The second thing universities like OSU do is they do research. So our faculty are doing research on problems that matter to the region. So that includes people doing work on creating clean water in Bama Nabasa's law, uh, work on how we, we talk across the political and social divide in the country. That's Marino's work. Work on just water problems in the West, groundwater, surface water. Skylar Herzog's doing that work. Shannon Liskin and Brian, Brianna uh, Kathari are doing work on, on childhood resilience, helping children who have experienced trauma navigate um, both uh, K-12 and their communities after that trauma. Things that matter to the region, and that's part, and our students get to learn in that environment. It's a, it's a different kind of setting than, than some universities. The last thing that land-grant universities do, next slide, we have impact. And, and so traditionally at land-grant universities, so OSU and OSU Cascades has access to this. We have, we have offices in every state, uh, every county in the state through the Extension Service and the Agricultural Experiment Station. But I, I just picked one. We're doing something on the site there that most entities couldn't do. So if you don't know the site, it's 128 acres in the middle of Bend. 10 acres of it was usable when we started. About 45 acres was an old pumice mine and another 70 acres was a demolition land filled up the older parts of the pumice mine. And so this is a site happening right now where the first eight acres of the innovation that we're going to be, and, that's that, and that eight acres is going to be the first step in building a public-private partnership where we bring early stage companies, community, no. community organizations onto campus to work with our faculty, to work with our students, to build economic success in Central Oregon. The next phase of it, phase of, of, of working on the landfill is going to be taking out um, a section of it in the middle of campus where we're going to put academic buildings. Building in the foreground, we're building now on land remediation we did all. That's going to be the Student Success Center, the first thing that's kind of a student union type building. The two buildings behind it are what we're going to build on the, on the remediated landfill site. One of them is going to be a health and recreation center, going to bring physical, mental health, physical uh, for students. And it's going to be our second uh, housing project, something uh, 150 beds to help ease the, the housing difficulties our students are finding, the community is struggling. I think reasonably had no value. The reason that, that a land grant university or a university can do it is that we're going to be there for decades. Our time frame for, for getting recovery on that is, and we have the ability to take that long view and in partnership with, do, with the community, do something that really no other entity could do. And it's a really exciting thing. And the last slide, I would just say that partnership, um, one of the things that has struck me about coming up to Central Oregon from Corvallis yeah. is the importance of partnership in what we do. We started as a partnership with COCC. The campus is only here and it's only succeeding because of the partnership with the community, the voices in the community that have been in the legislature. Yeah. The voices in the community helping us build those buildings. It's essential in, in all of higher education. Higher education is um, community colleges, universities, and we are in partnership with the K-12 system. It's essential. That's part early childhood education is part of that. It's an ecosystem that we have to think about together. And that partnership is really powerful. And I thank you so much for the partnership you brought to getting us this far. Um, how do you think that the college experience has changed since most of us were students, if, if we went to college? Um, I, think, I think that there are just maybe greater expectations now. And it's a generational thing. They're more questioning. They want services. Um, and they articulate those things. I think students and their yeah. family, they want to know what the value add is. Uh, they really want to know what the job path is and what the career is. 
the the challenge partly comes from how the world is changing. Social media, the mental health challenges. Yeah, you 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 bring up a point I wanted to linger on a little bit. One thing, your presentations, at least the COCC, um, we've experienced more broadly is one thing: people are coming away from their colleges, eat their educational expenses. Um, how do you feel like that dynamic is affecting both your see. students and your abilities to serve? Only 20% comes from state funding. So I just think that's pretty different. Um, I think that um, the, the state legislature has been pretty good to community colleges in my time in the state. And... Um, the funding increases have been modest but steady, and that's yes. a good thing. But we know there's so much more we could do to help students succeed. Um, we know the research. We know what works. We know if we added yep. these kinds of positions or more of them, we yep. could increase our success rate almost certainly. So... Um, I know, you know, there are so many worthy causes out there, um, and from a community college standpoint, I feel grateful for the support we've gotten, but it's kind of sad to also, there's so much more we could do. And, and the, the student debt, this is the professorial side, sorry, the, the student debt conversation is complicated because if you look at the the national average average of all student debt you're including debt for graduate school school you know those things very high debt sometimes you're including private for-profit schools but there is significant take that out look at OS, look at oregon state and i think it's something like a third of our students graduate with no debt but of the undergraduates that graduate they're graduating with an average of something like 23 or 23 debt Okay. Yeah. So if you're us, that probably doesn't sound like an astronaut. But if you are starting out life and maybe you don't have a family that's so that is huge. I'm not. So the, the other side of that that's important for us to think about is who is paying the cost? And you can argue about how fast the cost is escalated, but what has really changed is who pays the cost. And what we're spending a lot of time thinking about is how do we change that? How do we help students either through state financial aid or federal financial aid or institutional financial aid to help them with that cost when they can't afford it themselves? Um, would money solve some of the problems we've been getting at here? I mean, I guess a, a broader way to ask the question is, what do you most need that you don't already have to achieve the goals that you've talked about for your institutions? <laughs> this one, they're ready for this one. You, you can tell we have opinions. <laughs> For me, what, what would help the most, the money is important, but what, the reason the money has changed is because the value of higher education as a public good isn't appreciated anymore. In the end, we're engines of economic development. Every, the thing that doesn't work is if you start in higher education and you don't come away with finishing. But if you come away with a baccalaureate, a baccalaureate degree in my world, you are going to do better off. You're going to earn more money. You're going to pay more taxes. You're going to have a different kind of job. You are going to generate economic activity. So those investments for the state and the nation generate a return. And somehow we've moved away from that as a commonly held view of higher education. Um, well, I would certainly take additional funding from the state. But, you know, I also want to add that... Uh, our students come to us with a lot of needs. Um, they may not have housing. They may not have transportation. They may not have child care. They may not have um, adequate clothing. So we focused a lot on how to do our best to provide some of those things for our students. Because we all know if you're cold or you're hungry, you don't learn. So the more I'm in this role, the more I see that student success, it's our responsibility. I don't shun that, but it's so connected to other really important social issues that it's, it's hard 
to influence. A pivot. I do think it's a pivot, um, at least in community college circles. It's a pivot that started to happen, I'm going to say, five, six, seven years ago. So um, we're pretty familiar with this trend and our need to do our best in, in this area. Uh, so it, it is a pivot, and it's an, and it, and it's an expanding of missions. And, and no different for us and for every university. I'm mean, just thinking about those students who can't meet their basic needs. How do we do? How do we help them with those? Because the story says you cannot learn. Thinking about these sort of shifting mindsets, what imagine you're imagine I am a, student, a potential student who is saying, you know, the job market is calling. What ideally higher education does is get you on a pathway, on a ladder that allows you to build your skills over and it leads to more and more opportunity, to better outcomes, to more wealth. So staying in, in one job and maybe doing that for a while, that may be a dead end. Yeah, same answer, and, you know, why should you do it? Here's the return if you're successful. It's one of the institutional things, though, that we are thinking really hard about owning is that if students start at any any university and they don't finish, they get through two years or three years and they don't get their baccalaureate degree, that is a bad bet. That's not good for them. And so we have spent a lot of, we are spending a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure the OSU strategic plan right now, one of the three things we said we're going to do, we're going to be a university where every student graduates. And... and Everybody kind of went, well, you can't do that. Well, yeah, by the numbers you can't do that, but it can be a mindset about how you approach the problem. If we admit you, we're going to do everything we can to make sure you graduate because we know if you graduate, it's a good thing for your life outcomes. Um, another issue that came up when we were just chatting before this forum was the pushback to diversity, equity, and inclusion programs um, being foundational to all aspects of, of university, even being part of university culture. Um, what's the temperature at your institutions? I like our, our institution overall is, is very supportive of our DEI program Good. studies job. And so um, other areas, divisions have taken on projects to become a more equitable, welcoming institution. I think of our academic staff and our instructors engaging in anti-racist pedagogy. So I know there's a lot of backlash against DEI in, in the country. I'm not saying we're perfect. We have work to do. Yeah, there's a lot of support for DEI work we're doing both in curriculum and in, in the institution. One of, one of the things I, honestly, I have struggled with the way in which DEI has kind of been kind of weaponizing to this issue of every student graduating. The students show up at our doorstep with vastly different life experiences, and that can be economic experiences, the community they grew up with, on and on and on. And if they come in the door in the North Port Burns, and I do exactly that, I'm not maximizing the chance they're going to finish at the end. And that's the goal. Every student's in every student graduates. And that means we have to think about the individuality of those students and what they need to get them to that goal post. One more question, and then we're going to turn it over to our very smart friends in the audience here. Um, we've talked a lot about some of the challenges that you're facing and the adaptation. What are you most proud of? I, I would just say, I mean, I've spent my life in higher education for a reason. I describe the job I have right now as the best job I ever had. I'm kidding. Because I'm in the middle of a group of people who are spending their lives trying to make a difference in the world. And there's no greater difference than, than graduating a student and coming back five or ten years and hearing from that person what that experience I can't imagine a better way to spend it. Uh, I'm just uh, really brief. Edu college education changed me a lot. I want to come back. Getting emotional just thinking about it. Um, 
Well, um, everybody help Lori not cry, but let's, let's all pay attention to someone else. Um, we have 15 minutes for audience QA. Um, we want, um, we have a couple folks who are graciously moving around with microphones. Um, uh, please raise your hand. Have you considered maybe just like sitting down with a kid and being like, hey, uh, Maybe we don't have to, ha you can not take a few of these elective courses so that yep. when you graduate school, maybe you won't have as much debt, you know, like maybe reducing the amount of seemingly unnecessary classes they have. Like about I, streamlining I, degree requirements? Yeah, especially for kids that can't afford this kind of stuff. Think about, are there alternatives? Can you, can you use an online course instead? Yep. Summer term makes sense. Are there lower cost alternatives? And, and there are very intentional efforts to help them with that. The other thing, though, is, is I would just say there, there is a conversation about those unwanted classes. In the, and what, what I say, so you're gonna, your work in life is going to be 40 or 45 years. And I think there's a constant conversation about what is useful other courses and what's maybe not. And that's a really important one to have. But I think that breadth is actually as important as the depth in some. We think really hard about what are the, what are the things that have to be in a degree program. Um, and we don't take that responsibility lightly, but I, I really agree with Sherm as well that you can learn skills, and you, you should, and those are really important, yep. but more general things that you learn, how to be a critical thinker, how to, how to express yourself, how to communicate, how to um, appreciate diverse viewpoints in people. And so... Those things are just really important too. Not just the specific work skill somebody gets, but the habits of mind that people develop. Go ahead, right. Blair. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a question to follow up on student debt. Um, it's been a long time since I've graduated, but, uh, but I'm still paying off debt. And I just wonder in today's, you know, contemporary world where this idea of student debt is so huge, um, is it still as easy to get all that money? I, I, I'm concerned because I know for me, frankly, I wasn't a kid. I was an adult. So my question is, these days, what is the, what's the pro, has the process changed off gaps or, or helpers there in financial aid to really look at individual students? Yeah, I, I would have to say so. I'm out of my lane in terms of financial aid, but basically, I think access, access to those loans is pretty much the, as easy it and was easy in some ways as it was yesterday. because there's a whole host of different players. There's the government and a sponsored loans that all, do go through financial aid, where students can get counseling. We've started a financial that literacy that program. It's voluntary right now, but trying to help them about that. But then there's a whole private sector of parent loans. There's a whole set of things we never see the institution. So, so, so our role has to be making sure a student is asking the right questions, making sure they understand what they are obligating themselves to. And, and most of all, the thing we control most directly, how much financial aid can we generate so that for the students most at need and most likely to take loans that they're not going to sustain, that we keep that from happening. Another question in the back. It's my understanding that you both meet with the school district superintendents every month. Could you talk about that relationship? We do, and um, it it's um, I just it's a it's a meeting I just personally really enjoy. I think we have amazing superintendents in Central mm -hmm. Oregon. Um, we talk about opportunities for partnership, and we talk about common issues that we're all addressing and try to help each other. So it's uh, it's definitely about connection and partnership. We try to create industry partnerships, particularly in our uh, shorter term workforce trainings. And we've been able to partner with several employers in the region, construction program in Primeville with Fortis Construction and uh, on the many data centers. And through a number of uh, folks being very generous and contributing to the meta for um, those students had free tuition. They were given the tools that they would need, and uh, they were paid for attending because they went to school nine to five, short term, got it done, and if they successfully completed, 
they were guaranteed an entry level job. So those things do exist. I'm here to say if folks have more ideas, I'd love to hear them. It, and for us, part of, you know, if we can, if we can find ways to build that experiential learning into programs, they can benefit the people employed. One of the things that we're working on is those are, if those are paid internships, it provides a benefit to the student, a very direct benefit to the student, but it's got to have substance, it's got to have value. This challenge, um, this idea that the college uh, degree only is important if you get it rather than the courses that you take. And um, it felt like if you don't finish, then you failed. And I thought, I mean, in my own family, I have a daughter that almost finished, and I am so grateful that she went as far as she did. And I don't consider what she did as a failure. But it And I really appreciate you challenging because it is true for many students. Just the ability to engage in the community it does have value. When I say that, what I'm talking about is kind of the middle of the bell curve, this issue about if you take debt and you graduate and, and, and don't graduate, it, it changes your career trajectory for the average. It's one of the reasons there, there's a lot of conversation right now about rethinking how we, the institution, credential people. So, you know, there's two paths. You, you come to Oregon State and you graduate with a degree or you cannot. And there's an intermediate steps in trying to start to, you know, maybe, maybe you get the equivalent of an associate's degree if you do every month's kind of work. There's ways to think about that along the way. So it's not just one thing you know, or more. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question as well. You know, one of the big debates in community college or all of higher education. How do you know your students are succeeding? How do you measure student success? And for me, the perfect definition is did the student meet his or her goals? Great, if that was one class, if that was three years, whatever it was, and they met their goal, that's great. That's really hard to measure. Uh, and, and you know, the, our creditors, our legislators want to see data. Um, and most of our student success measures are about progress and completion. So I agree. I think we need to look more broadly. Let's take one more question. <laughs> um, it, you know, there's a, it feels to me, and I think we've all talked about, a balance between and where, how you focus your research. What does the community, institutions, and industries, and so on need, and what degrees do they want, and of course, and I just wondered if you could comment on that. And, and that's a good place I'd say it, it's, not, it's not an either or either. If we're going to build out for us a university, parts of one, one part is training people to do things, to be a, to be, but it's also training of learning that comes from experience. So that you know, just train the this yeah. off the business side of it as well. But the goal is to have that curriculum so of training the whole person and giving them a lifetime of skills, not just a go out the door skill. Um, thanks, Rod, for the toughest question yet. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, the, the calculation, I agree with what you're saying, uh, kind of an ideal world. With limited resources at a community college, we try to have a broad suite of programs. We try to give students choices. But candidly, we also need to, and we need to learn to make choices about where we're devoting our resources because they are finite. And so we've had some debates about whether a community college needs to have a broad range of foreign language offering or whether it needs to expand its nursing program. Maybe, maybe not quite that overt, but that's an example of the kind of issue we grasp. And so it's just hard. I wish I had a, a better idea. Um, I will also say that I think it's advising for students is really important. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with a student who wants to get a graduate degree in English and be a professor. But if I'm that student's advisor, we're going to have a serious discussion about what the job market is, what the time commitment to do that is, what the pay is, what your life's going to be like. 
And if you still choose that, great. I would be supportive. But you need to have the real estate. Thank you both so much. I'm going to turn it over to Kim Gammon now to close this. Thank you so much to Emily, Lori, and Sherm for leading us in conversation today. And thank you to our planning team, Christine Coffin, Zach Boone, Blair Garland, Julie Brown, Emil Vitas, and Kathy Schroeder. Our next City Club Forum will be uh, Citizen Assemblies, Reinvigorating Civic Engagement. This will take place on April 18th here at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. This is a morning forum and membership registration is now open. Non-membership registration will open on March 25th. In April, we are launching our spring membership drive. Any member that refers a new member will receive a free forum pass. While members receive discounts on attendance, the real value of your membership is keeping City Club going. Whether you attend one forum over the year or attend all of them, know that your membership is supporting this community and access to our programming. The impacts of our forums and discussions are wide-reaching and we are glad that you could be with us today. Have a wonderful afternoon.